so I said that we were going to explore the north part of Rookie Harbour later. This is that time. There's not actually a whole lot up here. Mostly there's just a couple of trader stalls, exactly one shop, and a, you know, a chest or two. It's not that exciting, but the game makes a very big deal out of it. Does the shop have anything that, you know, is good? Well, what this shop has is all of the items that were submitted by Kickstarter backers, or Indiegogo backers. They're all here, they all cost 7,777 credits, except for one which costs 9999. And honestly, it's pretty good actually, despite its price. I mean, the joke is that it gives you um, defense, uh, it gives you attack extremely up, focus extremely up, SP regeneration extremely up, and credits extremely down. <laughs> thus channeling the suffering of millennials. And they sell the standard range of steel and silver equipment. There's a chest in here, and it seems like, oh, there's a secret back door somewhere, but actually you just have to jump on the counter. Cross code. Now the real question will be that after we get... When, when we get past the silver tier of shop equipment, will we then get brave or killer? Well, that would be a spoiler. I kind of breeze past it, but over in the, the northwest of this area is where apparently Tala Tulips actually lives. We can't go in there for whatever reason. Here's where I actually got the appetite equipment from. But yeah, this building is basically just full of traders that trade stuff from other areas. They're all unique as well, so you have to talk to all of them if you want to fill out the trader book. Because, well, cross code. These guys look like they should be traders, but they aren't. This area is basically just there to hide the way up to this bit. And this bit is basically only here to contain this room. And all this room contains is a single chest and another one of these things. Took me a little while to remember that we don't actually have to get over there. We just need to break it. So there you go. I see. And that's pretty much it. The big thing we're here for is to go and pick up our next round of side quests. Nonsworth obviously wants us to go back to that main train building and go and talk to, like, the head capitalists? I guess is their role? Ah, I see. So we have to get our instructions straight from Jeff Bezos himself. It's honestly a, a tiny bit more interesting than uh, he makes it sound. Anyway, to our complete shock and surprise, we've learned that there is going to be another round of state quests. Once again, they insist on censoring the names of the ingredients that we need, even though we're pretty much going to be told what they are. Now that said, it's going to be a long time before we can actually do this, because most of what she wants is actually from Gaia's Garden, and we literally can't go there yet, even though, according to all of Crossworlds, we can, because Emily just literally will not let us.
Police obviously want us to continue working on their whole gun running problem. No random references to the wire this time though. The adventurers obviously want to continue their investigation into the weird, mysterious hillcat tech that we recovered from that one cave. That's the one we're actually going to do in this video, by the way. Well, actually, I tell a lie. We're going to make we're going to make a start towards it in this video, but we're not actually going to do it until next video. And then a surprising break from tradition. Manzana actually wants us to kill something. Oh, the legendary fire cow. Yeah, he warns us that we're going to need to do a little bit of a plot quest before we can actually reach that area, because it's behind that one door that we needed the rabbit to open for us. But we've already done that, so we can just stroll right on in here. You might have spotted this cave entrance earlier, but now we're actually going in there. So, how comfortable are you with uh, the whole ice bubble thing? I mean... I love this, this opening one. It's just such a complete dick move. Because remember, if you try and make that shot from too close to the water block, it will explode in steam and you will get pushed out. The first one didn't seem too bad. Oh, it's platforming. Okay. Hmm. I mean, it's always platforming. Right, but like... Yeah. You can never tell sometimes whether it's, oh, do they want me to platform? Is this some, side of, come, some kind of stupid shot that I'm supposed to set up? Yeah. The answer is all of the above. It's a great time. I was sorely tempted to, uh, to break out the Ice Walkers one more time for, like, what would have been the fourth time, I think. But I managed to resist. A little preview of what's coming up. So, remind me, how exactly did a cow that was on fire get into this cave? It jumped. Any questions? I mean, you know, not to channel too much of the Trani energy here, but... Mm, I, I don't know about that one. Or maybe this cave was actually just an entirely normal cave until it ran in here and broke everything, and now it's a hell abyss. That's also entirely plausible. I mean, I suppose... You are not incorrect. The cow could have carved these bottomless pits. And set up all of these free-floating water blocks, don't forget.
never underestimate the potential for the Trek of the Ancients to interfere with local wildlife, and vice versa. I mean, how could I possibly forget the, uh, the saga of the goat? Right? Anyway, mind, mind the perspective here. It makes it a little bit tricky to realize that you are in fact jumping straight into a wall if you try to run straight here. I love this whole sequence. It's just... Just look at it. It's beautiful. Not gonna lie, I'm a little disappointed that it wasn't timed just a little bit better, so that if you tried to jump immediately after the ice, like the ice, the water block would come up right as you were jumping there. Every now and then they do actually miss an opportunity to do an amazing troll. Anyway, this is a little bit weird. But it makes total sense. You gotta stack one ice block on top of the other one. It's just that it, it has to occur to you that that first one is actually gonna stay frozen for long enough to make this possible. And yeah, I keep shooting it with the wrong with the wrong thing. But we got there in the end. Also, don't forget to shoot it exactly the correct number of times. Finally, there's another one of these. This one took me a second, but Once you try making that shot, the solution to this becomes pretty apparent. And again, mind that steam. Oh boy. Well, it's time for a goddamn boss fight. Try not to read too much into the jump cuts here, by the way. I mean, I can only hope that the cow, which is also on fire and also forged this entire cavern, is worthy of such, such a title. Oh, it's worthy of something, all right. So, the baseline gimmick here is that, like all of the other cows, he does a big charging attack and you want him to charge into something, thereafter making him vulnerable. The catch is, of course, that all of the walls are made of water, so you have to freeze them first before he charges into them. I'm sure I don't have to explain to you that, despite him literally being a fire thing charging into a big block of water, that that won't phase me very much. Also, I mean, come on, he's weak to ice, obviously. Now, he is not invincible from the front. He is just armored, so all of the all of the stuff that I said before, stuff that can go through shields, can still do decent damage to him. So if you want you can just do a bunch of indigo strikes. And that will make some decent headway. But on the whole, he's really fast at turning around, so you... you want him to be getting stunned on stuff. Did my best to get as big of a skip as I could here, but... well, there's only so much you can do. 
then we start getting into the actual problem part. For his next trick, he puts up a big wall of fire. And you've got to hit him from behind it by using frozen bubbles and the ice to bounce things off of. It's uh, a little bit weird. Yeah! Absolutely. Absolutely something to get stuck on for a little bit. And of course, you know, in case you forget, this is still a fight, so you need to, you know, not die and stuff. By the way, you notice how um, every now and then he does a little kick and a big plume of fire comes off of him? That obviously can melt ice and evaporate water. So you've got to... You gotta stay on top of keeping those blocks frozen. Flip side of all this is that being as how he's weak to ice, you can inflict chill on him and that will slow down his movement and well, I'm sure I don't I don't have to explain to you that that's quite useful in this fight. For our final trick, we have to do this whole dance except without the magic redirection bubbles. So you've actually got to get your ricochets going. You actually can finagle this a little bit, because in the time between when you actually fire the shot and when it connects with him, you can move, which will make him move, which will make the shield move. every little bit of advantage you can get. Oh, by the way, in the third phase, every time he does a charge, he does a little plume of fire first. So, uh, watch out for that. The practical upshot of that is that you basically have to actually get the freeze in, in the gap between when he starts moving and when you dodge out of the way. I can't lie, this guy is a complete asshole, but I actually kind of love this fight. It was a lot, but it doesn't seem like it was a terrible fight. It's a hell of a thing. I guess the big deal is that, uh, unlike with the cursed Sharkster, there's actually enough of a difference and there's a progression between the things that he does in the second phase and in the third phase, even though they're pretty similar. But it's just that escalating thing of, okay, do this thing, hit him in the back, okay, now do this without the magic bubbles. It's some good stuff. Would you like some level 2 techs? Okay, you, you gotta pick the laser. What are you- how are you not picking the laser guard? I'm disappointed in you. Well, I actually am. I just wanted to show that uh, one thing that's real nifty about the elemental trees in particular is that you can cross-specialize your combat arms. So if you want, the level 1 and level 2, um, where there actually are two, they usually have you know the big area utility one and the big single target damage one. And if you want, you can have your level 1 attack be one of them, and your level 2 attack be the other. If you want. I don't actually do that so much with fire, but I am going to do it with ice. In particular, I, I actually like the shield art rather than the counter for the level 2 ice guard art. And for the projectiles, I like having the, the, the Snowflork be the first level, and the Minigun be the second level, because Snowflork isn't great for damage, it just gets stuff frozen in a big area. And it doesn't do a very big effect, but it's a level 1, so you can spam it a bunch of times. 
and I'm sure I don't have to tell you that we're upgrading the Frozen Star. Three Frozen Stars! That's a big number. That is a big number. Here's a laser. Hell yeah! It does a decent amount of damage, and it sets stuff pretty much directly on fire. Ooh! Here's our Frozen Star. That's... Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. It's about what you'd expect. The other really notable thing about the laser is that uh, Leah jumps really high into the air when she fires off the laser. And I don't know if this is still a thing, but there absolutely was a thing that you could do in uh, at least some previous versions of the game, where there are some areas with flying enemies that do a flying tackle attack. And you could go and stand by a ledge that you can't normally jump up, do the laser attack, and tactically get hit out of it. And you'd be knocked back, and you'd wind up on the ledge. I'm pretty sure there's at least a couple of sequence breaks that use that. Oh, the speedrun attack. I see. Yeah, come on, Emily. He's a biologist, not a geologist. I do I mean... I, I don't think he realizes that she's making fun of him. I mean, she's trying, but she she mixed up one kind of science with another. I mean, that's that's a pretty big cell phone, you got to admit. No, I think it's exactly the kind of own that he deserves. <sighs> anyway, there is one more screen here, and there is a side quest here that we're on our way to do. It's the, the one with the Hillcat tech that I talked about, but before that, there's a whole bunch of jumping to do on this screen. And I, I, I absolutely hate this bit in particular, because noticing that that little bit of wall is there is the crux of this whole thing. It's tiny. And I pretty much only got that when I did because I remembered that it was there because I got so angry about it the first time I played this game that it stuck in my mind. So there's that. Here I was attempting to demonstrate the potential utility of techs for breaking flowers, but I guess not all, not all of them go through as many wars as I thought that they would. But when you want to break a whole bunch of stuff, you could do a lot worse than firing off a snowflake at it. And no, obviously we're not done with this yet. Just a whole mess of stuff over here. <laughs> Come on, Emily. Okay, I was... Okay, I was legitimately joking when I said that Emily should bully him, but actually this is amazing. I love it. I'm kind of I'm kind of disappointed that they didn't have him actually come up with something. Like I am certain that the ancient language in this game is decipherable. Somebody probably speaks it. I, I'm sure that somebody in our guild speaks it. We are the nerd guild. Hmm. Like, let's call up, uh, let's fucking, like, ring up Beowulf and ask him what, what the village meant. This is the actual last screen of Autumn's Fall, and it's the one that actually has a direct path back to Autumn's Rise on it. 
which actually will matter a bit later. But of course, what we're really here for is even more jumping on stuff. And here I thought you were going to say plants. I mean, those two. It's just that, you know, I've been making a point of mostly cutting those out if they're not, like, directly on our path. By the way, it's real difficult to do all of these wall walking puzzles while playing on a control stick. Like, I'm sure I don't have to explain why uh, using the, the four-way keyboard way is a little bit less terrifying. Even for doing diagonal jumps, like, you can go in a definite diagonal direction. I fucked up, by the way, by jumping down at this point. We we're obviously supposed to go this way first. There's a whole lot of jumps here that look like they shouldn't work, but... You can pull out the dots and line them up. That was sketchy as fuck. And look at this shit, we're literally jumping on the, on the, the area door. Like, come on. That's not on. That's some Metroid Prime wall crawling shit there. And once again, Emily's here to assure us that the developers are fully aware of what they're doing. And that's it. We've done a complete circuit. We're now back in Autumn's Rise, and these are the regular, like, level 6 hill cats. They just... Th just look at them. They just die so quickly, it's precious. Ah, we've come a long way. You like to inflict violence, don't you? Thanks, Tronny.